Hello, welcome to a rather thrown together edition of Diminishing Returns. Don't say that. <laughs> Behind the curtain. I'm letting them see how the sausage is made because I think it's interesting to to see. But don't show them your sausage. <laughs> We, we, we've got some really exciting stuff in the works, and <laughs> the problem with this is, you know, sometimes something will... Uh, it's clogged up the sausage machine. Yeah, sometimes something will just have to get postponed, and we'll have to pick it up later. And this happened on the show uh, once back in the day. I mean, I'm, I'm going to full-on let us see behind the, the curtain here see how the sausage is made, but uh, back when we had Thomas Turgoose and Andrew Ellis on, I think we actually had a date lined up initially, and then that had to be cancelled at the last minute, and that's when we did Joker as a real last minute. Oh, let's just chat about this film that's out in the cinema. Everybody's talking about it. Yeah, and um, similar thing now, but there's nothing in the cinema for us to talk about, because cinemas don't (laughs) exist anymore. In fact, we've got got two episodes recorded, ready to go, but have had to be delayed, because the (laughs) films they're tying into have been delayed. Yeah, and I'm I'm halfway through watching the fucking Candyman movies, but um, I'm going to have to put a pin in that, probably re-watch them again next year. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. I mean, one of those episodes you just mentioned is available on our Patreon now, if you can't wait for our Purge episode. Mm, Yeah. So that's that's that went up a year ahead of its mainstream <laughs> release. That's the sort of benefits you get on the Patreon. Yeah, well, speaking of, we, we would have done this episode tying into Tenet, which is the only movie in cinemas currently. But we went and did a full-length bonus episode about, <laughs> all about Tenet for Patreon. And it didn't seem fair to give it up to Patreon and then just yeah. put it out on the main feed. You, so. you losers out here on the main feed. Gen pop. So what we've done, Alan, what? is what we've we scrambled done? together an episode at the last minute about a classic film yes, uh, that, that we felt would be best served with a proper discussion between just, just the two of us, you just and I. Just a nice private discussion. Very intimate. So, Sol, what are we going to look at? You wanted to do a classic. I flailed around trying to find a classic that I could be asked to watch immediately to refresh <laughs> my memory. Yeah, just so just to be clear, we decided to do this episode two and a half hours ago <laughs> 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 and then watch the film. <laughs> but that's good. It means it's fresh in our minds, Very the fresh, film, yeah. hopefully. I mean, it was two and a half hours ago. I had 15 minutes to go up into the attic to find the DVD. <laughs> we settled on... I mean, not because of this, but this is how I'm going to justify it. (laughs) The new TV show from Ryan Murphy, Ratched, about Nurse Ratched of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, based on both the book and the film, I think, loosely, uh, has just come out. At the time of recording, I think it comes out this week. Yeah. So by the time you are listening to this, it will have just come out. Uh, Reviews are... Pretty overwhelmingly negative from Ooh. from the quick glance I had before we started recording. It seems like everyone's calling it a a complete misfire. No one asked for <laughs> that doesn't understand the character. <laughs> but regardless, <laughs> regardless, we are doing a an episode tying into it with one flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, which mm. we are going to be discussing. A, a classic, a true yeah. best picture winning, probably in the American Film Institute's top 10 films or something it's it's yeah. you know it's one of those it is it's it is very highly regarded what is it number 18 on the top 250 imdb yeah num- number 18 with uh an 8.7 out of 10 score which is very very good and i mean you know let's let's just lay it all out there i i think i last watched this film when i was in high school mm. or around that era it's you know over 10 years ago and i had this down alan as a 10 out of 10 really but I have not revisited it until today. Interesting. So that's your teaser. Did it live up to... Let me give you a teaser, Sol. <laughs> <laughs> I read the novel on which this is based. Uh, I watched the film then. That was the last time I watched the film. That must be, I mean, several years ago. I had this down as a 7 out of 10 prior to rewatching. Oh, okay. So that is your tease. I'm not going to pretend I remember the novel in, in great detail, but I read about it as well, again, just, recent, just in the last 15 minutes. And um, there are some differences there. So uh, perhaps that oh, okay. w- perhaps that is reflected in the wet- last time I watched the film, mm. straight after reading it. I mean, it is very much the, um, the crowning jewel in the career of Milos Milos. Do you know how to say it? Milos... 
Malos Forman. <laughs> <the director. laughs> is it the crowning jewel? I mean, I appreciate... He, he also did Amadeus, though, you know? Yeah, I'd say so. He, well, yeah, he, he has a very respectable career. The standouts, I would say, are uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Hair, Amadeus, The People vs. Larry Flint. Mm-hmm. I would say One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is pretty firmly the, the most revered of those films. I mean, not to give too much away, I think I would prefer Amadeus myself. Well, I mean, not to give too much away, I'm not a big fan of his work. (laughs) Um, Hair is, I mean, I suppose he's hindered by the source material more than anything. I love some of the songs, but beyond that, I'm not a big fan of Hair. I think it leaves a lot to be desired. And I've never got why people like Amadeus so much. I I think it's very (laughs) lacking mediocre drama that uh, but i really like amadeus and i think it's probably a lot of that is down to direction because i think yeah yeah the story I mean, itself certainly... is not that interesting yeah yeah i mean for comparison's sake amadeus is also very well regarded but one flew over the cookies nest number 18 on imdb's top 250 amadeus number 83 i mean well what, what, what do you want one film in that list is pretty remarkable let alone two so yeah, you know. I mean, he won. He won best director for both. They both won best picture as well. Yes, yes, yes. Obviously, most one was from Czechoslovakia, I think, but certainly in the former Soviet Union, um, he was raised there. Uh, in the seventies, there was this influx of European uh, filmmakers, uh, which was being embraced, and, got, and there, it, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Definitely falls into that period. Of, oh yeah. New Hollywood, I guess you would call it. Yeah, people people talk about it being the golden age of Hollywood and that, you know, the 70s was when Hollywood started producing real art, like yeah. un, unfiltered, gritty, dirty, but like true art. And the 80s is when it became all commercialised and yeah. McDonald's, Happy meal Meal-ified and bullshit. And, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I think it's a pretty easy way to look at how things were done. But, you know, I think there's value in the films that have come out from Hollywood uh, from the 80s through to right now. Yeah, but there's, there's a general trend, I think there's, there's there's truth to that. But not not just in terms of what's getting made, but what is popular. Like, a film like yeah, this yeah. winning winning the Best Picture Oscar, that I mean, that yeah. you know, we've said before that the Oscars are really a, a statement of intent by the Academy to go, look what we're doing, aren't we great? To pull out an example that we've done on the show, I think Rocky is a great example of what we're talking about here, in that it's such a, a, a crowd pleaser. People love Rocky, it, but when you actually watch it, it's a real, like, it's quite an intimate drama yeah. It's not like this bombastic sports movie at all. It's quite an off-kilter, gritty drama about this guy who's come from nothing. It's It's got more in line with um, a Ken Loach movie or something yeah. than it has with your typical Hollywood blockbuster. So, But that's what was winning the the awards in the 70s, yeah. yeah. So M- Melis Foreman was one of a kind of a European influx, I guess, and an embracing of what you might call art cinema, but yeah, not just big, overblown, crowd-pleasing nonsense. Actually character-driven stories. Yeah. And for a while, that was very popular, for whatever reason, for whatever cultural reasons. And I think One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest is a real, yeah, shining example of that. <laughs> the fact that it just yeah. swept the board at the Oscars and all that, and uh, it was extremely successful at the box office as well, and obviously quite a small budget. Uh, same as Rocky. So not just, hey, this is the one everyone likes, everyone's talking about it, like it's Roma or something, but no one actually watched it. <laughs> We're talking about this, what is it, 45 years later? It's still, it's held to that position as a very popular film and a, and a well-respected film. Still gets put on those best film level lists. So the, the, the novel, just to give a bit of history, the novel by Ken Kesey was written in the early 60s, I believe 62 maybe, and it was based on his own experiences working in a mental institution. Obviously, it was a different time. Things were not perhaps as, um, Mm. what's the word, friendly (laughs) as they are now. People, uh, people's institutions were still used as a way to just get rid of people. Yeah. The undesirables of society. Not like they were in like Victorian England where, you know, if you, if your wife was giving you grief, you'd get a committee. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad. Uh, but it still was a hangover. Of but that. no, but someone with a mental illness, even one yeah, which is perhaps yeah. not all that severe, just get rid of them. 
stick them in an institution, drug them up, and they don't cause any trouble. Oh, well, you know, give them a lobotomy. Yes, which was a big thing. If you don't know about lobotomies, it's basically where you chop a bit of the brain out of the frontal lobe and it makes people very docile. And it was happened a lot at the time, back in the first half of the 20th century. It was a really popular thing. Yeah. (laughs) Weirdly. I've definitely read about someone who basically got a big metal spike, spike, um, put it in someone's eye socket, like... Like the Egyptians. Kind of over the eyeball. So you're not damaging the eyeball. You're kind of going over it and into the brain, mush it about a bit, scramble that bit of the brain, pull it out, boom, Bob's your uncle. I don't think even anesthetise them. Done. Jesus. Well, there's no feeling in the brain. No. No no nerve endings, because the skull is meant to prevent spikes from going in there. (laughs) That's the idea. So that's... (laughs) Look into lobotomies if you're not sure about them, because it's fascinating. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was... I was taught about lobotomies, I think, from The Simpsons. Yeah. Back when they did... A, a parody of One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> their fifth Halloween special, it was, where anyone who opposed Ned Flanders' dystopian society after Homer's time travel had uh, led to Ned Flanders being supreme ruler of the world, everyone got lobotomized, and I found it incredibly disturbing, the image mm-hmm. of these sort of drooling, happy-looking, bordering on zombies with bits of brain in jars pickled in their hands. It was an incredibly disturbing image that really stayed with me as a kid. Um, But I bring it up because, as you just alluded to, I think I kind of saw One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest via osmosis before I ever (laughs) actually watched the film. This is something I've spoken about before, but where a film is such a a significant part of pop culture, it will be parodied and, and referenced to the point that you're familiar with it without having ever seen it. And I I think this really is one of those. Maybe it's specifically The Simpsons. But but I think it goes beyond that. It's any comedy that ever does anything with an insane asylum will do the thing of, oh, let's have a Nurse Ratched character. Futurama has a Nurse Ratched, doesn't (laughs) it? Don't they? Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) Futurama did it wonderfully with the the HAL Institute for criminally insane robots. Nurse Ratched. And and the Simpsons did it well as well when Homer got committed and he speaks to uh, Chief. And Chief's like, oh, hey, how are you? And then everyone's like rushing around with notepads to make notes because he's not spoken in <laughs> decades. And he's like, oh, well, nobody nobody asked. <laughs> <laughs> Much like The Godfather and Psycho, I, I feel like you could probably cut this film together using clips of it being parodied in, in cartoons. And it goes beyond The Simpsons, you know, it, even as a kid in stuff like Recess and and you know, Disney <laughs> yeah. shows, they were referencing it. So that was the novel in the early 60s, and it, it was um, a, a big hit, uh, and it was a big success for Ken Kesey. Uh, the the rights to it, the stage and uh, film rights, were bought by Kirk Douglas, and they did it as a stage show. Ah, yes, yes. In about 64, I think, on Broadway, Kirk Douglas playing the Randall McMurphy role. Did the play, was trying to get a film off the ground for several years, couldn't make it happen, Sold the rights to his son, Michael Douglas, and it was right. Michael Douglas who managed to get it together. And it is Michael Douglas's name I saw in the credits as a producer, not Kirk Douglas, yes. Yes, and his, his name on the uh, best film Oscar there. By the time the film was getting made, Kirk Douglas was about 60 years old, and... Yeah, just too old, and so let that one go. Uh, And that's how we end up with Jack Nicholson in the lead role. So, let's talk about the cast. I think you could make the argument that this is the greatest cast in a film. (laughs) The greatest assembly of phenomenal actors in phenomenal uh, performances. I mean, I, I, that's not to say that I would agree with that, but I, I think it's very much a contender. It's a real... There's so many people in this film who are, have gone on to be significant far beyond this film. Yeah. In terms of actors who not only have gone on to be f- far more successful, but this is the first thing anyone ever saw them in. You know, the first film, basically. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so in terms of taking a cast of unknowns... But obviously, really casting some great actors. Uh, yeah, so many actors here have gone on to bigger things. Well, not bigger necessarily, but have gone on to be much more um, successful and, and, and 
take have a longevity of their career. Well, I mean, got Danny DeVito and uh, Christopher Lloyd yep. uh, reunited on Taxi. Yeah, just a few years later. Danny DeVito apparently played that same character in the stage play a few years before. Not, I don't think the one with Kirk Douglas in, but it was you know a revival. So he yeah, did it. Yeah. But also, bear in mind, Michael Douglas owned the rights. Danny DeVito and Michael Douglas are very old friends, it turns out, <laughs> since oh, like, really? being very young. You know, which, you know, they did those films in the 80s together. Isn't it? So why did it take so long for Michael Douglas to put him in a film? He was already successful by this point, wasn't he? <laughs> Maybe he wasn't quite Michael That's Douglas. That's weird, isn't it? Isn't, isn't, isn't Danny DeVito a, a, an oddity? Oh, <laughs> Do you know what, right? I think Danny DeVito's a good actor, but I also associate him with very specific kind of character i think he does the same thing uh a lot and yeah. he does it very well i've got a problem with that if i was putting together a list of my like top 10 maybe even top five favorite actors he would have a very good chance of being in it i think he's an incredible performer i wouldn't think of him as a particularly versatile actor yeah yeah you know i don't think many actors are particularly versatile and i don't think that's a problem but yeah you know, you're right he's he plays Danny DeVito in different levels of... Uh, you can dial it all the way up to Always Sunny in Philadelphia, or you can dial it down to, like, Get Shorty, yeah. but he's he's always somewhere on that scale. Well, and, and I think here, it's totally different. Uh, he He's doing oh, a yeah. full-on character, and obviously all the actors are, but it, it is kind of seeing Danny DeVito as you've never seen him before and almost you forget that it's him which I think is obviously good he's also so much younger than you think of him so Mm. he doesn't really do much but I think that's the the beauty of this ensemble cast especially when characters can go so big so often it doesn't feel like they're vying for attention or anything like that Mm, absolutely I'm not sure exactly what the process was but it feels very improvised and yeah. that works to its great advantage as well. The film itself was filmed on location in a mental institution. They slept there as well. They like right. they lived there for three months while they were filming. Did they do the classic thing of you are only allowed to eat lunch with your inmates and Nurse Ratchet has to stay <laughs> away from everyone um, I don't know about that, but I wouldn't be surprprised. The, so the, the place where this was filmed in Oregon, uh, uh, the same mental institution that the book is based at, so they just went straight to the, to the source. And the right. guy who was the director there obviously was just way up for it, and he gave them total access, he gave them access to the film. He, bas- he took the actors and said, watch this guy and like assign them a particular patient go, this is this guy's got the condition you're portraying just watch him and and copy what he does and so they go and got assigned so which is you know obviously brings a lot of great truth to what they're doing um also he plays the main doctor like the guy who is the real director like right. i think he was just like one of those people who was just like hollywood is here yes let's give them anything they want and we yeah. were, and obviously it was really low budget so i think when that happens it, it it it's less kind of distant and you can really get involved and he's basically plays quite a significant character in the film and does it pretty well uh so but i think all that really adds to it as a as a location it's a set you could build really easily actually even on a small budget but the fact that they're all in there... There's an authenticity to it, I think. Pr- brings you into character, I think. It's going to pull you in a bit more yeah. as an actor. I mean, look, this is this is not a reference that's going to play for everyone, but we before we recorded this, we just did a little Diminisode uh, available on our Patreon, patreon.com slash dimreturns. Uh, we, we just did a little Diminisode, and I spoke about uh, loads of films that we have spoken about on this show in the past that I hadn't got round to seeing at the time. And we spoke about Cult of Chucky, which is obviously a Chucky movie. Uh, so <laughs> trashy horror, I suppose. Yeah. Although arguably the higher end of trashy horror, but you know, a, a very different kind of film from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But I'm bringing it up because that is also set in an insane asylum. And I, I just think for comparison's sake that is blatantly a set from what i yeah. remember rather than uh it certainly doesn't seem like a real active hospital they're filming in it just feels artificial it, it, i think you can tell when you're dealing with artificial sets and and so on compared to what you have here which is just as you say you could build it put it together no problem but it, it just feels lived in and and i don't know there's an authenticity that comes with that yeah, definitely. And uh, and I think just from a, an acting point of view, that's going to help uh, get you into character yeah. a little bit and, and just envelop you in the world, the improvisational nature of it. 
certainly the way it feels that way. Mm. I mean, it can't have been totally just stick some cameras on and go at it. It's obviously had a script and some structure, but it gives it that yeah. f- that freewheeling feel to it. And there's some there's some bits more than others that really feel like they just let him go for it. Apart from Danny DeVito, we've also got uh, Christopher Lloyd in his first appearance. A very, um, not subdued, what's the word I'm looking for? A very restrained Christopher Lloyd in this film, yeah, I would say. Uh, be- A good indication of what to expect from his career, but yeah, restrained. Mm. I love Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> Fair Just <enough>. in general. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't, yeah. to be honest? I, I don't think anyone doesn't love Christopher Lloyd, do they? And, uh, yeah, you, you're right. He is restrained. He's also, like, of all the sort of mental disorders that we sort of see in, in the characters, um, some are obviously much more apparent than others. He, I think the idea is he's, I'm not sure what's supposed to be wrong with him exactly, but he's not there voluntarily. He's forced to be there, <laughs> which suggests that he's and he he has moments of kind of aggression and and yeah. There's a there's a dark edge to him in this film, which does come through, even though he doesn't come across like an unpleasant. Yeah, he definitely antagonizes the people around him. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I say, he he reunited later on shortly later on with um, Danny DeVito for Taxi, he also reunited with cast member Angelica Houston, who plays a woman in a crowd <laughs> on a pier. <laughs> well, she would have been with Jack Nicholson at the time, wouldn't she? They were together. He, of course, reunited with her on the Adams Family films. And um, talking about Chucky before, Brad Dourif's in this film, the voice of Chucky. Mm, very young Brad Dourif. I think this was his debut as well, I think. Yeah. This film is the, the framework for all of Hollywood that's come <laughs> since, it seems like. I mean, yeah, if not his debut, it's certainly the the breakout uh, role for Brad Dourif that he was known for prior to becoming more of a Oh, yeah, and that, of, all, of all the roles, of all the characters, he's the, that's the one, apart from the leads... Oh, he's the heart of the film. He's, he's the one that's like, that's the one that everyone's going to be seeing, that's the one who's going to get awards or whatever, you know. But he's also, he's the sympathetic character, yes. arguably the only... <laughs> real hero of the film. Right? Yeah. Um, one other person that I recognise who went on to many other things, Vincent Schiavelli. Oh, which one's that? The one with the weird drawn out face. And the oh, the eyes. one from the Hills Have Eyes poster. No, no, no. He is in it. <laughs> and he has got a weird face. Yeah. Uh, no, Vincent Schiavelli. Oh, what did we see him in recently? Oh, it was one of the Bond films. He's an assassin oh. going to kill Pierce Brosnan and Pierce Brosnan kills him instead and he's in ghost he's the subway ghost and ghost oh i love vincent schiavelli <laughs> yeah so this is also one of his first appearances and the beauty of this is these are guy these apart from brad deriff these were kind of unknown actors certainly on screen but they're mm. not youngsters it's not like there's a load of youngsters so that's their yeah. first roles yeah. They're all in their 30s, you know, Christopher Lloyd's about 37 or something like that. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, um, you know, these are just guys who are undiscovered or, you know, probably, probably working on stage. I think they've not got any screen credits, but it was, you know, it's in the 70s. That's not necessarily easily yeah. done. Another notable one in here before we get to our leads. Scatman Crothers? Scatman Crothers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, look, I, I don't know much about Scatman Crothers, to be honest. I, I know he was in the Aristocats and I know he was in The Shining. <laughs> My understanding is he was a musician yeah, who yeah. kind of started popping up in films. So I'm man. guessing he was a, a known entity prior to this film. He wasn't like a name, though. It wasn't like, oh, we'll get Scatman Crothers in for that. It was like, look, we need an old black man. And he's one of the people that comes to the auditions. It's not. I don't think he was a name uh, enough to get cast on the basis of that. I don't think. He's good in this, but I mean, who who doesn't love Scatman Crothers? Oh, exactly. he's, he's just such a such a warm likable presence of uh, <laughs> yeah. an actor. He's in one sort of major set piece of the film, and uh, we'll come to that later. He's made such an impact in, in Hollywood for a man who has had, I mean, really two <laughs> substantial roles. And even then, they're like, you know, 
two or three scenes in the film. It, it's quite remarkable, really, I think. But <laughs> Another sort of standout, and one of the main characters is Will Sampson as Chief, the big, yes. big Native American who doesn't speak. Um, Has he gone on to do anything else significant? He did a handful of roles as playing, you know, like, big Indian and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he wasn't an actor, though. I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I've just loaded up his IMDb, and his second to last credit is someone called Tall Eagle. <laughs> there you go, right? That's uh, all you need to third know. to last is Chief. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't an actor. So, fake Sitting Bull. <laughs> Painted bear. There's a there's a theme. He he wasn't an actor. The, the, so in the book, in the novel, the um, the whole book is narrated by this chief character, Native American chief. Oh really? Um, and it's all told from his perspective, like he's telling a story about these inmates uh, and stuff. And also, he's a schizophrenic. It kind of makes him an unreliable narrator. He's talking about how uh, you know there's a, there's a machine he calls the combine that are trying to take you over like trying to control you and stuff like that it's kind of much more paranoid like slightly less grounded in reality but anyway they because he's in the book he's described as this huge big uh, native american they were just looking for a big native american and they found one he wasn't an actor but he's seven foot tall or whatever so um that's it that'll do give him, give him the job uh and he lived lived locally not that there's any anything remarkable about his performance here, but what a presence, you know? Yeah. He, he really is a, a find uh, for this film. He, he brings so much to it, just just with his with his presence. Mm. I think that's down to direction. We've we so we've seen this before with say Shane Meadows, who takes essentially non actors a lot of the time, or certainly inexperienced actors, and gets great performances out of them through use of improv and bringing their own thing into the characters. Yeah. I think that's what we're seeing here. Well, Jack Nicholson was a known entity at this point, but this was still very much the film that made him. It's difficult to say that he was an up and comer ex- ex- exactly. Like when he he won the Oscar for this. Yeah, he'd just done Chinatown the the yeah. year before, so you know he was a lead in a very well regarded. Yeah, but he uh, he won the Oscar film. for this, and it was his fifth nomination. So he had four previous. So you can you can hardly say he was like an unknown. But but I know what you mean. He hadn't become big leading man Jack Nicholson and, uh, until. Well, this is it. You know, I, I, was he nominated for Easy Rider? That's one of the. That was the film that made him. That was the film that made him known and then he kind of churned over a few like well-respected performances but not big films so he was nominated for five easy pieces the last detail yeah. and then chinatown so they're like getting bigger these films but they're he's well his performances are very well respected in smaller yeah. films easy rider is you know it's very much a supporting role he's, he's oh, yeah, basically yeah, yeah. got one scene in that film essentially obviously that's a bit of an exaggeration but but you know he leaves a mark so i i feel like this was the point where he's like oh he's a lead but also he's kind of zany <laughs> he's kind of our madcap guy because yeah. you know chinatown arguably that is jack nicholson reining himself in you, you he's known for a bit like nicholas cage who we've spoken about quite a lot recently on this podcast yeah i thought that as well yeah he's known for having a kind of madcap energy that a good director can harness and, and direct and make good use of and that's clearly on show with his earliest work in uh, the little shop of horrors and easy rider <laughs> and it's you know it's what he is now still best known for with things like the shining which followed this. I, I think this is kind of like, I think this was arguably, if not the film that made him, I think it was arguably the film that made him what we think of him being. Yeah, what you think of sense. as Jack Nicholson. Yeah. And then your our other lead, playing Nurse Ratched, who is the primary antagonist of the piece, Louise mm. Fletcher. This is also her film debut. She was a, a very experienced TV actor. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. Um, won an Oscar for a, for a lead performance um, under yeah. the Academy Awards classification and then yeah. disappeared again, really, which is... Well, it has never stopped working. I mean, really plowing away the work, that's not been yeah. a problem. But I think it is a very good performance, but I think it's a very easy thing to play yes. um, for the most yeah. part. That kind of cold and calculated feel unemotional is easy to play and she has some moments and she definitely brings some great things to those moments 
I'm not I'm not taking anything away, but Well, you know, I, I completely agree with you. I, I've I've said similar things about the likes of Hannibal Lecter, um mm. and Anton Sugar in No Country for Old Men's another one. I remember people yeah, raving about that. Javier Bardem in that film and and, he, and you know, he essentially does nothing by design. Yeah. That's what the character is. He's nothing. And um that's not to say, you know, they're doing a great job of doing that, but yeah, I agree. They're pretty easy roles to play yeah but having said that because i've always kind of been a bit dismissive of of her in this film uh for winning that oscar because i would also say she's a supporting role not a lead role but um yeah as i say i last watched this film when i was a teenager i think if if not early 20s so i really you know focused on the performance i do think she brings a bit of depth to it actually there's some very nice subtle moments definitely yeah yeah yeah, that go beyond that kind of completely emotionless automaton yeah and having that playing opposite jack nicholson's madcap energy is perfect as well like it's it's right for the part yeah 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 so let's that's the cast um let's crack into the plot a bit well yeah. So basically, what the, we establish is uh, Jack Nicholson's character, Randall McMurphy, is uh, a bit of a ne'er do well, a scrapper, and a, and a petty criminal who keeps getting thrown in, in jail. There is an argument that this film is not aged well. Well, because of the whole shagging children thing. <laughs> well, th- that was, yeah, that is the first thing I'm going to point to in, in, to make this case is that he's in the asylum for statutory rape. Well, he's in prison for that, yeah. I look, m- maybe, maybe this is just me not reading things correctly. So I'd like your input on this. But it feels to me like we're meant to kind of go, "What a scamp! He had sex with a fifteen-year-old. What an absolute little rascal!" Like I don't think <laughs> you're meant to go, "What a scumbag!" or anything. And no. I think that probably speaks to the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's not forget it was at Jack Nicholson's house where Roman Polanski raped that child. <laughs> so, <laughs> around this time. Is that so? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, he fucking hell. He was there that know. day. Like, oh, dear. Like, is him and Angelica Houston, Roman Polanski's like, oh. can I use your house for a photo shoot with this 12-year-old girl? They're like, yeah, yeah, we're off out. See you later. Here's the keys. Uh, so, yeah, oh. anyway, that was it. <laughs> but, you know, it was a different time. <laughs> But there you go. So that that's that's the first point that I think is aged badly is that you're presented with that and you're meant to just go with it. Like, ah, oh dear. <laughs> if what he says is true, you know, he, he says. Uh, I think the quote he says is, um, "She was fifteen, going on thirty-five, Doc, or whatever." You can believe. Oh, he he, be- you know, he didn't know, and it's unfortunate. But I don't. I think the way the film is presented is he knew full well what he was doing. And that's yeah. just an excuse he's thrown out there. Yeah. So it's kind of odd that he is presented as a a hero of the film for much of the Well, here's of the one of my kind of major problems with the whole thing in general. I think he is a character, he's too likable, I think. Well, I, I think my issue with it is that the film needs to establish morality in a way that I don't think it does at any point. It, it kind of presents you with him. And he is a mixed bag because he's, on one hand, I mean, you know, putting a pin in the 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 statutory rape, he's presented as a you know a, a criminal and and a quite an unpleasant man in a number of ways beyond that. But then he's also, like you say, presented as a very charismatic, charming man, and and I know that those things do often go hand in hand, and and you know we, we've obviously spoken about A Clockwork Orange before, which is one of my all time favorite films, and that's very much a, a a protagonist of that nature. Yeah, I you know I think the difference is A Clockwork Orange is all about examining the morality of Alex, its its uh, protagonist. It's yeah. all about exploring the nature of good and evil and the relationship between them. This film, it doesn't really feel like it quite grapples with that properly, <clears throat> I don't think. Um, no. And I, I think he's... We see that he is anti-authoritarian. I mean, th- yes. we kind of get the impression that's why he's ended up there, because he keeps causing problems from the, in the prison, so they're trying to get rid of him, and he's kind of gone along with it because he thinks it's going to be an easy ride. 
uh, Easy Rider. Um, and <laughs> he, so he's gone along with that for the time being. But he's got the anti-authoritarian streak, so he immediately comes up against Nurse Ratchet. Also, we see genuine compassion for his fellow uh, inmates, let's call them. Yes. And yeah. t- to quite a significant degree by the end. And it's not a kind of weak progression of he has to learn how to get along with others. It's there right from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah. self-centered. He kind of presents it often as a kind of like, hey, I'm going to do this for me. But it's not. He, he is... He, like when he escapes, he takes them all with him, you know, like he just yeah. takes them on a jolly and then goes back. No, he knows full well they're going to get caught and he could just run away at that point. I just think for the purposes of what we're doing in this film, he needs to be a, a bad person in some respects. So we need to see that side more. Or the film just needs to lay its thesis out a bit more clearly if he isn't going to be that, you know, clear cut one thing or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Because on the other side, we get Nurse Ratchet, where, where we should be able to see her going, it's not all about you, I've got the cake for this, this is happening for them. She says those things, but it's always in this way that you think she's just using that as a way to to get what she wants. And But she is just manipulative and presents herself as caring about these things, but all she really cares is about, is the order, the authority. And all she cares is that things are going to routine. This is... Another aspect that I don't feel is perhaps aged as well as it might, because it's it's difficult in this day and age to view a film about a, a woman trying to keep a load of rowdy men in check. As do you know, what I mean, it, it it's it's like well, on one hand, she's just trying to do her job and be a professional, and these idiots are getting riled up by this scumbag <laughs> you know it, and she's <laughs> yeah. just not got any time for it and but that's what i mean i think i want to see that a bit more that side and i don't think we get that i think there's definitely a, a story there about a, a, a character with the best of intentions who cares about people just being worn yeah. down to the point that they you know make compromises and just ultimately land on the side of evil and it's about power corrupting, isn't it? She's she has she has this despotic power over them all, and so she's mm. like, when when someone gives her trouble, she's like, well, I can get rid of them by doing this. But, but she doesn't. She's not thinking I'm going to be malicious and evil. It's just she has the yeah. power to get what she wants, and she takes it. And I think that's presumably what the pitch was for Ryan Murphy's TV series that we we are tying this into very loosely, uh, Ratchet. But apparently, apparently, it completely. You know, I think most people thought, oh, she's going to start as a nice, pleasant character and and slowly, you know, Walter White style turn into this evil version that we know from the movie. But apparently, at the end of the first episode, she like convinces a man to commit suicide, and it just you know, it apparently you know it just doesn't quite. And it, it's a shame because you're right. I think one or two scenes in this film, just giving her a bit of humanity, would have done this film the the, the world of good. Because there there are there are hints of that in the performance, but it just comes off cross as passive aggressive. As in, yeah, look, yeah, I'm fucking yeah. you right now, kind of attitude. And I think maybe just a little bit more subtlety there would have helped and, yeah, and build yeah. that throughout the film. And on on the viewing I did before we started recording, I was watching it very much from a, a point of view of, is there a way to view her as a, a hero in this film? You know, is it constructed in a way that she is the, the true protagonist of the piece and and we're not meant to like jack nicholson and i've been kind of misreading it and blah 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 blah. but in the third act she she ultimately pushes billy who i think as i say is the beating heart of the film um and is very much presented as a an innocent really i think Mm -hmm. um she pushes him carelessly and unnecessarily she pushes him to the point that he commits suicide and Mm. you know obviously that's not her intention but it's still very much her fault. But but all of that is basically, as it goes along, the further Murphy pushes her, the harder she pushes back. And that is our climax, where he has had this massive party and it's become this huge thing. Billy becomes the kind of centre of that, almost accidentally, just because of how he's com- in a compromised position. But whereas she can't get to Murphy because he won't give, he won't, letter 
she can get to him. And so she just needs to, in this position where she's... Yeah, she she can get to Murphy through Billy. It's um, it's like how Green Goblin can can attack Aunt May. He can't get Spider Man, but Aunt May, right there for, <laughs> right, yeah. for the taking. Shouldn't have told him that he was Peter Parker. That's why she goes so hard at him unnecessarily, frankly. Yeah. And it, that's when you, she really comes across as a, a nasty piece of work. But we we also never get. The come down of that, we we never see the consequences of that particularly when she finds out he's dead because it's not her piece. We're not showing her character. How does she deal with that two days later when she has to see the mother who's an old friend and all that sort of thing? The guilt that would come with that. Or would she not feel guilt? Is that the character? It'd be nice exactly. to know, so, yeah. One of my other kind of major complaints is... I, when the film started, I was really into it and I was like, I'm really enjoying this great mm. acting. I'm engaged... And then it was just sort of like an hour later, and it was hadn't gone yeah. anywhere. <laughs> like it just, it. I I think it's a fairly long film. It's about two hours yeah, fifteen minutes, yeah. but it's quite loose in terms of the scenes where it's just setting character, it's setting the scene, and it does a good job of that. But I think it could do a good job of that with twenty five. Yeah, minutes I, less. I completely agree. You know, I I had the same thought really. Whenever I was. Whenever I'd become aware that I was watching a film, and you know, I guess whenever I was pulled out of the submersion within the story, um, mm. I would sort of think, "God, I'm I'm really enjoying just all these standalone scenes of these actors just doing their thing. I'm I'm really enjoying yeah. it." But you know, one hour forty five in, it did start to drag a bit, and it was like, "Right, okay, I I kind of get the dynamics now. If we're not gonna." progress them beyond this i mean obviously they're getting more extreme in some cases but they're not yeah i i agree i think i think a, a solid editor could you know take another 20 minutes out yeah. of this quite easily and i think the film would be a lot better for it or not even that just just replace 20 minutes with 20 minutes of different footage you know fleshing out <laughs> nurse ratchet i think that would be the big climax of the film is you know after that party and everything that final act of defiance it, it leads to as we hinted at before a lobotomy on uh mcmurphy mm -hmm. and i i suppose seeing a hint of humanity from nurse ratchet before that would completely undermine that moment and arguably seeing it after that would undermine that moment so yeah, it's tricky. But that's it. I, I believe that she as a character, after Murphy um, attacks her and almost kills her, yeah. that he she would basically have him lobotomized. I can totally believe that. Well, he's a dangerous, you know, inmate. I mean, I think there's a way to present that without her being a villain, frankly. To take a look at the bigger picture, what is the film trying to say in its kind of context? So this was written in the early 60s. It was... Uh, and I think the writers mentioned something regarding, so, you know, it was the civil rights movement going on mm -hmm. at the time. People being sort of trapped in a system where they have no power yeah. uh, and that sort of thing and kind of trying to fight against the odds. Also, it was obviously directly about mental institutions because he'd worked yeah. in them. The The director, Miles Foreman, said that he related to it because he'd grown up in a communist state where he was being told what to do and how he was what he was allowed to do and say and things like that. So that was how he um, connected to it. But I don't think that comes across very well as a big picture sort of thing. I don't watch this and think, oh, this is like, you know, standing up to the man about this. It's, it, this is like about civil rights movement. It, it feels too enclosed for that. But I do relate to the McMurphy character in this, particularly in those early scenes when he's in the group therapy session and he's sort of like just starting to realize where he is. And there's this person who's kind of got all the power and is just controlling things and everyone else just subdued and doing what they're told. And that's pretty much how I feel on a daily basis in the world. <laughs> like, you know, just kind of not quite that extreme, but like I do feel like a lot of people just live their lives on autopilot and do as they're told. And, some, and I like a bit of a rabble rouser to come along and shake things up sometimes. You love it when Ian Brown goes on Twitter <laughs> and starts uh, banging on about coronavirus <laughs> being a hoax, telling all the sheeple to wake up. Exactly, yeah. Until Jed would call him out. <laughs> Is this all happening? Are you making this up? This this just happened today. Jedward uh Jedward Jedward's still a thing? Well, not really. They are now because they're <laughs> they've waded into a feud with Ian Brown. And, uh... <laughs> Is Ian Brown still a thing? 
Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I've served Ian Brown in a supermarket. Alex. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's Manchester, isn't it? <laughs> Small place. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> Other other people in the shop were excited on my behalf after it happened. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's been going on about not wearing a mask and coronavirus being a hoax and all that. And then Jedwood came along and said something like, you're, you're breaking our hearts with your disgraceful lies, but we love your cheekbones and you're really pretty. They said something to that effect. <laughs> yeah, that's a positive message, I suppose. <laughs> that's the world we live in now, yeah. So, so on that sense, I was relating to it, you know? I, I kind of, like, I, that's when I was really getting into the film. It was sort of the earlier stages. But I didn't get much of a sense of bigger picture from it all, did you? I was really hoping this conversation with you would help me solidify my thoughts on this film. And, yeah, my 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 thought, really after watching it is i'm not really sure what the thesis is mm. what the the point of this film is it's obviously making a sort of anti-establishment argument of some kind but then it's it's quite a muddied message i think and i don't know if that's intentional nuance or if it's just <laughs> kind of aged in a way that has clouded the message unintentionally it's, it's quite difficult to get a gauge on it i think because mm. I, I i think really there are no there's no clear cut this is a hero this is a villain in this film i think there, there's kind of good and bad in everyone but i think it's presented as though you're meant to just think nurse ratchet is pure no shimmer of light in her heart she, you know i think that's kind of how you're meant to read this film i think that's the way it's come out years later i think that's the legacy of it i don't know if that was the intention when they made it i'm i'm thinking i think i think in the novel she is more directly sadistic and quite evil and she even the so the three main orderlies who work on the ward the guys who just sort of are knocking about and doing stuff. Yeah. Like in the novel, the idea is she specifically picked them because they're sadistic. You know, she's she likes them because mm. they're real nasty pieces of work. But as you say, the, the novel is um, from the point of view of Chief, who's an unreliable narrator, though. So is that perhaps... I can't really remember. I think there are explicit kind of scenes where they're doing horrible right. things. And they're deliberately doing things to antagonize people or hurt people physically or, you know, doing things that are no, they're going to wind them up like on, on due to their mental illnesses, you know, which yeah. which is not in the film. You know, those orderlies, they sometimes have to get involved and throw some fists, but they're generally just, you know, just some blokes doing getting the job done, you know, and, and it can be quite sympathetic sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if it's just implied or if it actually says it, but the idea is that the main doctor who works there is under her thumb as well because she's got some dirt on him that like he's a drug addict or something so she, she he kind of just basically just has to go along with whatever she wants so she's really running the place even the doctor is kind of um kowtowing to her so it's a bit more directly she's a real just pure evil kind of thing I, yeah i don't know it's it, I, I feel like i want a, 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 a yeah a sliver of life in the character yeah like you say just a pure evil character isn't interesting Especially in something that is quite grounded in reality and, and has depth of yeah. character. What, what else happens in the plot? Um, they go off. Um, they they man he manages to escape with all of them in a bus, and takes them fishing. Yeah. Um, no apparent consequences from that, really. <laughs> they come back and everyone's like, "Oh, go on, get back in there, you cheeky." Well, he he. he... He specifically says as much. He, he he says to a woman that he meets up with on the boat. He says that's the beauty of it. All they can do is put us back in the the asylum. The whole point is that that's not all Nurse Ratchet can do. She can she has so much power within those walls, um, yeah. and she she does manipulate them. And we have a few set pieces where you know he challenges her over the TV. Uh, what they want to watch on the TV, and she she doesn't back down. That's a bit of a they have a set two on that, and then the night it's a nice bit where he just starts to pretend he's watching, uh, and all the other inmates get really into it, which works nicely as a scene, and it's like a way of him getting his victory over her, and it works because it winds her up, you know, and she's trying to get him to stop. 
I don't know. It just seems like the obvious thing for her to do would be just to walk away. Like, how long is she going to keep that up for? <laughs> like, it's a pretty shallow victory because she's still yeah. not getting to see what he wants to see. But it's a big turning point in terms of him getting the other people on his side yeah. over her. So that's the real thing. You know, he's challenging her authority. Yeah. And I think yeah. the the bigger, bigger picture thing that I took from it, if we're talking about like a bigger picture idea is institutionalization so he finds out halfway through the film that the vast majority of the people there are there voluntarily they're not they're not imprisoned they're not sectioned they're there because they don't they can't cope outside or at least they feel like they can't yeah yeah it's played as a real twist really isn't it it's... yeah not not just that wow why have you why would you come in here if you don't need to be here but also that they count out to this authority when you can just walk out at any time why let her ration your cigarettes and, and bully you? Why let her choose what's going to be on the TV when you're just like, I'll oh, sod you, I'll walk out? And it's it's that institutionalization, I think, is the real point. I think that's what the point of it is. And, and put that into a society terms. Being sheeple, you know, not asking the questions, not not rising up, not using the opportunities you have to, to fight back. You know, I feel like that is saying something. And I found that very interesting, the institutionalization of it. With someone like Billy, it's kind of, you can understand why he's there, in terms of why he stays there. Like, he doesn't feel powerful enough to walk away, even though he could. Mm. Uh, and, you know, he's obviously got an overbearing mother or whatever. But then there's some of the characters, like the Vincent Schiavelli character, he's like, he's, the idea, is he, he's just epileptic. Like, that's, that's what's wrong with him, you know? Like, yeah. he's, he should, he's of kind of normal intelligence or whatever. He can look after himself and all that. So... Why do they stay? And we don't, unfortunately, we don't get any backstory from for him in any real way. Mm. But you know, that's that's another story, isn't it? I guess it's not what they're trying to do. I suppose the music's worth touching on. There's quite an iconic theme. It's more like Chief's theme than the film's theme. Mm. You hear it at the start of the film, and then again at the end when. When Chief, of course, um, has his climactic moment. We, we've not spoken about that moment either, actually, have we, really? Um, I mean, the, the big ending of the film is that Jack Nicholson pushes too far, too hard, and he, he gets lobotomized, and then Chief uh, comes over to, to kind of say, like, hey, we knew you'd... Uh, you'd get out all right because he he's just under the impression that he's gone into like what solitary confinement essentially yeah well they took him to the other ward yeah yeah chief's all excited to have his mate back and have a chat and you know he shakes him realizes what's happened he's just a essentially a a, a vegetable nearly um obviously not quite but he's not he's not really a a person in the same way that he used to be. Yeah. Chief takes it upon himself to uh, mercy kill him, <laughs> like smother him with a pillow, and then uh, mm-hmm. lifts the fountain, smashes the window, and runs off into the distance, and uh, that's probably the most iconic, famous part of the film. And that's the end, isn't it? Yes. And what is the end for Nurse Ratchet then, as you see it? She enacts a revenge. And everything just goes back to normal. Well, this is it. I just, I, it would be really nice to see a bit of, I, yeah, I assume she's obviously lost a bit of her, I feel as though she's presumably lost a bit of face. But has she? It's undermined her authority. Well, the person who undermines her authority is now taken care of. So, <laughs> yeah, surely that really hammers home, don't fuck with me. Well, in doing so, Chief properly acted out and ran off. So does that not? leave an ultimate assuming they don't you know catch up with him down the road and wheel him back in and uh keep him there Mm. i feel as though that's ultimately undermining what she was doing plus i i feel as though him mercy killing jack nicholson is something of an undermining because it's almost played like she wants him there yeah lobotomized Mm. as a kind of reminder of like look what i can do to you rather than well in the book the ending is slightly different oh Go on then. He attacks her, you know, in the same way. She's badly injured. They pull him off and take they, him what? off, whatever. They they pull him off. <laughs> Pardon? Clean him up and then, <laughs> and then <laughs> take him up to another ward. Uh, and then, you know, he comes back lobotomized. Chief kills him, escapes. The major difference is, by the time he comes back lobotomized, she is back from wor- back to work after taking a week off to recover, but 
everyone else left apart from a few of them like they've all uh. just kind of walked away she has lost that authority and so the ones who were there have just gone not just because of what happened to her but because of billy and all that they've just gone this is a terrible sick place i'm walking out yeah the other major the other major difference is that she can't really speak properly anymore like the damage to her larynx or whatever oh. she can't speak in the same way and so that undermines her power or whatever so that's the major difference in the ending uh it, which i think is quite a dramatic difference because if mm. the, the film kind of gets that well it's all just goes back to normal i guess kind of feel but that that is exactly what i mean about the film feeling like it perhaps doesn't present its thesis it, it feels like it needs a coda at the end to yeah summarize the point and i feel like that scene where she comes back and everyone's left would be a perfect cap on on the end of this i i I don't know if the thing about a voice that feels like it's a step too far to be honest but in the other direction well in the film her having a strong voice isn't a part of it maybe that's in the book more that she's powerful with her voice and she has authority yeah i i I think i think that would play just fine it just feels like that's the same thing twice to me. I, I feel like everyone leaving. Plus, it, it just feels a bit like he's physically beaten her down yeah. that way, if you know what I mean. Whereas I think, it, you know, if he's physically damaged her throat, that's, that's like what? So he's won by throttling a woman. That's not... A, <laughs> where, whereas you can kind of cheer in a way, for him inspiring. Because ultimately what he's done is inspired the others to to take their own authority. Yeah, to live their life and take charge. Yeah, exactly. And I think that is... And then he's he's the martyr of the revolution, isn't he? That's, that's yeah. what it is. So I, I would like a film that has half of that ending, but not the voice <laughs> of it. Well, should we, should we get into our ratings? Uh, yes. Oh, hello. Oh god, the doorbell broken. Yeah, baby! <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Lost 10 powers. Oh, he no. Must have, he must have seen that you give it a 10 previously. He, well, he heard. He heard. I said at the start, didn't I, that I gave mm. this a, a 10. Yeah, baby. Os ten powers, baby. In the off chance we've we've got any brand new listeners listening to this episode who are absolutely baffled right now, Os ten powers is a, a wonderful comedy <laughs> character who uh, who turns up when films get the rare ten out of ten treatment on the show. Yeah, baby. <laughs> um, we, we've not seen you in a while, have we, Os ten powers? You, you've not. Um turned up i think to be honest i think you just didn't turn up the last few times we gave a 10 out of 10 (laughs) social distancing baby yeah (laughs) oh yeah that's a good point that's a good point (laughs) so why why are you here you said there was gonna be a 10 baby oh well i mean (laughs) i'm not engaging with this character (laughs) (laughs) There's, there's not there's not much to it really i, I should um, <laughs> i should look up some like slang from the 60s next time just have it yeah so i mean i'm sorry us 10 powers i'm i'm really sorry to to disappoint you but um i'm actually gonna i'm dropping the score down well not groovy baby not groovy <laughs> at all <laughs> Sounds like Alan Partridge. <laughs> yeah, he does. He's got to, yeah. Got to work on my Mike Myers. Austin Power. He's actually Mike Myers is Austin Powers. He's actually quite high pitch, isn't he? Because I, I pulled some uh, clips out for that Tenet episode. Oh yeah. Uh, edit. And I was struck by how up here he was when he was talking. Hey, Basil. Uh, anyway, yeah. The point is, this was down as a ten out of ten from me. Mm. based on me watching it as a teenager and i think just not seeing there's a lot of remarkable stuff there it was you know it's one of those films i watched when i was getting into film it's a huge renowned classic i think i saw that there was a lot of great stuff going on and i just assumed it all mm. came together in a way that perhaps was going over my head yeah yeah i understand now i am a mature <laughs> film person yeah reevaluating it i don't think it is that remarkably great. I don't think it quite holds up. I do think it's a great film, but 10 out of 10 is insane. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm bumping it down to an 8. Mm. Uh, as I teased you earlier, I gave, I had this down as a 7. 
Yeah. But I, like I said, the, the last time I watched it would have been... You better put that up to a 10, baby. Just yeah. Up for it. Well, uh, the last time I read it was after I... Last time I watched it was after I read the novel. So I, I'm... I, I am, Obviously, I can't really remember the novel in that much detail. I'd be, but I suspect that had some influence to play. Perhaps I felt like it didn't do justice to the novel. But there are all, obviously these good elements that we've talked about. Watching it now, without the novel in my mind quite clearly, I really... Love the acting, like throughout. It's the type of film I like, <laughs> in the in the style of it. It is a bit baggy. Never quite finds its premise, like you say, I guess. But ultimately, the good elements I have felt justified to knock it up to an eight. Oh, met in the middle. Yeah, eight out of ten all round. I think that's fair enough. Uh, so Os ten powers, Get fuck off out of here. <laughs> it's coronavirus, mate. We're still gonna be. That's that's solid, I think. Eight, eight out of ten. A solid eight. Oh yeah, it's definitely yeah. Uh... Yeah. Part of me was like, is this a nine? Is it like a low eight point five kind of a nine? But it was just when it started to drag for me, I was yeah. like, no, you know what? Yeah. It's just not that great. But it's a really solid eight, and I I think there's a lot to love about it. So yeah, that's quite a severe reassessment for me. It's quite. It's quite unusual that I'll revisit a film and actually come away thinking quite differently about it. Mm. Usually I find that I was actually completely correct (laughs) in my initial opinion and I've just started to doubt it, but I shouldn't have done. But I think because this was something that really was one of the, you know, first proper films I I, uh, watched and I really, you know, haven't gone back to it in so long. I think the only other film like that I can think of off the top of my head is Twelve Angry Men, which uh, you also threw out as a possibility for this Mm. episode when we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. So we will have to look at that at some point. The classic Twelve Angry Men. Which I th- I think I have down as a ten out of ten as well, but you know how much you love Sydney Lumet. We've established. Yeah, we have actually. Yeah. Okay, that's it, isn't it? Classic one, classic in the bag. We we haven't done many like classics like this, have we? We we've done The Godfather, we've done this. Well, we tend to t- tie into Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. We haven't done Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, haven't we? <laughs> no. I think you're thinking of whatever happened to Baby Jane. Oh yeah, we haven't done Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> That wasn't just me using the wrong name. I, I, I full on had a memory of us discussing, you know, a, a film about a failing marriage and it just never <laughs> happened. That's really weird. Marriage story you're thinking of. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. We'll have to do Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf next. And uh, yeah. How about this? What about this for the next Patreon vote? The classics. Like, we'll pick the top Ooh. 10, like, on every classic Casablanca, Citizen Kane, that sort of stuff. Like yeah. and just get them to vote on like let's do yeah. a let's do an all time classic. Which one do you want? Yeah, I like it. I like it. I mean, right now Patreon is duking it out over what Pixar movie we're going to do in an upcoming episode. Oh, are they still uh, deciding that? Yeah, I I thought it was settled. To be honest, I thought it was going to be Monsters Inc because that ran away with it. I looked at our Patreon earlier today, and um, one vote behind is Wally bringing up the rear mm, so it, it could very easily be wally could be monsters inc i don't think anything else is gonna steal it away at this point but it's it's neck and neck between those two so if you want to have your say on what pixar film we cover uh later this year head over there and have your say along with all the bonus material and all that shite one dollar a month that's bargain it is a bargain it is actually we, we're like we we put so much more bonus stuff up than we need to <laughs> I, I always i always feel like oh we have, we've not put in a, up a bonus episode in ages we've not done a diminisode in ages and and then i look it up and it's like week and a half ago we put an episode up yeah you know i i i'm only working to like one diminisode a month for a dollar a month but we end up putting up like way more than that point is bargain one dollar a month all this bonus stuff We've we've been getting inventive, doing lots of fun stuff, playing quizzes, looking at my lists, because, you know, we used to look at new releases and that's not happening much at the minute. Mm. Uh, head over there. Have your say. And uh, it's, it's coming up to Christmas, so, I mean, we haven't confirmed either way, but I think it's quite likely there'll be some sort of Christmas episode voting going on soon. And then we'll have to figure out somewhere we can do this classic vote, because I like the idea of that as well. Nice. I mean, this is the problem right now. We've got a load of potential cool guests 
but they're all very up in the air and tentative based on people's schedule shapes. is much more fluid than it used to be i mean that's another thing i mean if you're really interested i posted up a heavily redacted image of our upcoming slate for the next three or four months on patreon and it was kind of a game where people could try and figure out what words were under all the crossed out <laughs> <laughs> bits and you know they 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 pretty much figured it out you can see what our schedule was gonna be i'll sh- I, I should really pick one of those pronunciations and, and just go with it shouldn't i because I, I um you can see what our schedule was gonna be and compare it to what it actually ended up being and it's already completely different because you know <laughs> kingsman 2 got delayed so kingsman 3 got delayed so our kingsman 2 episode got delayed um we have actually recorded that and and will be editing it and putting it up on patreon as an early release thing so that's yet another episode that you can have months and months in advance if you head over to patreon anyway this ad for patreon's gone on for far too long <laughs> now so all right. All right. So yeah. Oh, and talking about advertising for shit, uh, check out Development Hell, <laughs> uh, the 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 brand new podcast from me and friend of the show Connor Murray. That at the time of this going out, I think there'll be two episodes available. Look for it. Development Hell. Nice. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, Alan. Before we go. Yeah. Let's hear your best Jack Nicholson impression. Oh God. <laughs> At least I tried, goddammit. At least I did that. Yeah, could be worse. <laughs> it was just a sort of American accent. <laughs> you got, you got to go for the more extreme, uh, extreme Nicholson. Yeah, you gotta kind of, you gotta stretch out your words. You can't handle the truth. So that was just a normal person saying you can't handle the truth. You've got to go. You can't handle the that's truth. Not how he says it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's bordering on the guy out of the B-52s. All right, Sparky, here's the deal. What's that from? Because, I mean, I, I know I know Aladdin, which is where I know it from, but I'm guessing Robin Williams was alluding <laughs> to something else when he did that. Right, Sparky, here's know. the deal. Ah, uh, right, Jack Nicholson. <laughs> Are there any other big Jack Nicholson performances we need to get to on the show? I mean, arguably Chinatown, but d- uh, depends if yeah. we ever want to get into that whole Polanski, Polanski, uh, I mean, it's, is it worth getting into it? <laughs> Hornet's Nest. <laughs> we spoke about him in our Once Upon a Time in Hollywood episode. I think I called him a scumbag. Oh, well, controversial. <laughs> I mean, it is if you're Whoopi Goldberg, but I think most people are on board <laughs> with the idea that Roman Polanski... Isn't a great guy. Not a great man. Although, you know, fantastic filmmaker, and it's very upsetting for me that his uh, films elicit such an emotional reaction from me at times. Because it's like, oh, I don't, I, I feel violated that such a scumbag <laughs> rapist has been able to uh, <laughs> elicit an emotional reaction from me. In a in a sort of <laughs> sincere way, don't know how to feel. It, it's really weird that when I watch The Pianist, it's like I really don't know how to feel about this because this film's really getting to me on an emotional level as intended. But Roman Polanski's a bad man. One one flew over the cuckoo's nest. One what's flew that? East, one flew west. What's the name? Is that a poem? What is that? It's a nursery rhyme, maybe. In the book, it's obviously the chief's the narrator. I think it's a, his mum used to say it to him or something like that. But yeah, it's either a, a poem, perhaps. Fair enough. All right, <laughs> that's that. See, you learn something when you listen to Diminishing Returns. It's a silly title, though. You're right. It's a stupid title. Yeah. Well, you know, it's of that era, isn't it? Clockwork Orange, Straw Dogs. Names weren't allowed to be straightforward. You know, nowadays, <laughs> Iron Man 2. You know what you're getting. It's the second Iron Man. <laughs> Tenet. <laughs> oh, I mean, you, Tenet, yeah, because the name doesn't make sense, but that, that's because the film doesn't make sense, so it's it's by design. Oh, wow. For more on that, head to patreon.com and listen to our full-length bonus Tenet episode. Right, see you next week, guys. Diminishing returns. And and thank thanks for joining us, Os Ten Powers. Even though I kicked you out, I can hear you lurking behind the door. Yeah, baby.
Thanks for having me, baby. Does Austin Powers have any catchphrases other than yeah, baby? <laughs> yeah, you need to watch the film and get to grips with him before you start bringing him in as a character. All the famous quotes uh, are Doctor Evil. <laughs> well, let's have him as a character then. Let's have Doctor do. Doctor Three Evil next time we give a three out of ten. <laughs> Right, that you've you've brought this on yourself, Alan. Next time a three out of ten rating is dropped on this show, get ready for some frickin' sharks. <laughs> that was Jack Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs>